Greetings, my fellow historians. This is the first lecture of the semester. And uh, one of the challenges that I often run into in classes like this is a beginning point. Where do I begin? Uh, I'm not alone. If you know anybody of the historian variety, we, we struggle with the starting point. We fight ourselves not to go back further and further and further to really, in our minds anyway, understand where we're coming from. So I'm fighting myself as a historian, but what I'll say is our class is going to begin in what I like to call the late 19th century. Some historians, and I certainly would qualify as such, some historians call this period, late 19th century, call it the segmented society. Um, you'll see why it's called the segmented society for, uh, for very specific purposes, but a little bit later in this lecture. For right now, what I would like to do is to get you to understand what America looked like and how it kind of was organized, right? Its feel. If you had to describe life in America in the late 19th century, what most of us would probably say it was comprised of is island communities. Now, of course, we're not talking about Hawaii. We're not talking about the Samoan Islands. We're not talking about Great Britain or anything like that. It's a metaphor, right? We don't literally mean islands, but if you think about an island, right, you'll get the right idea. An island is a body of land that was surrounded by water. It's isolated in that respect. When we say island communities, what we really mean are these small American towns. These are small towns, but they're fully functioning. They're completely independent municipalities. Everything that you possibly could need for your day-to-day -day survival was right there in that town. Now, I want you to stop for a second. I want you to ask yourself the clothes that you're wearing, uh, the breakfast that you ate this morning, um, the, the transportation that you're going to use later on this afternoon, however you want to define that. Who's providing that? Where did that come from? Chances are it came from someone that you've never met before, that you're never going to meet, probably in a part of the state that uh, you either haven't been or don't go very often. And there's a very good chance that it came from somewhere in the country or maybe even the world that you've never been, will never go to, and maybe don't have any interest in ever visiting. My point is we live in a very interdependent society, which would have been completely unrecognizable to the late 19th century American. They lived in these towns where people did an enormous amount of work for themselves. An example, if you were to press the late 19th century American for what he did for a job, most of these people would describe themselves as farmers. Now, of course, they mean, you know, people that grow corn and milk cows and all that fun stuff. But you had to be a blacksmith at the same time, because if your horse throws a shoe, you don't, you're not going to have time to walk him all the way to town and get a blacksmith to do it. You're going to need to do it yourself. If your son falls down and busts his arm, and first of all, in the 21st century, we've got a very romanticized understanding of what children are, what they mean. In the late 19th century, they were your labor force. So if he busts his arm, you're going to need to rub some dirt on it. You're going to transform yourself into a makeshift doctor because you can't afford to lose an entire day's work. People did an enormous amount of work for themselves. Very different than the working world that I'm sure you're accustomed to, right? You can take me as an example. Um, what I do is I teach the classes here. Uh, I'm not really in charge of the administrative side of things. I've got a very specific role to play, and I play my role within the context of my job classifications. If you are following along with us on the PowerPoint slide, what you're looking at there is a general store. How you got through your just regular day-to-day -day life was also very different and unrecognizable to, to us as modern American citizens. There was no such thing as these great big massive stores. No Targets, no Walmarts, no Kroger's, no nothing, right? What you had were these general stores where you would go down to get the the ingredients, the, the what you might call scratch materials to, to do things like make cookies for yourselves. 
make pancakes for yourselves, prepare food for yourself. When I say people did a lot for themselves, the general store is a very good example as to exactly what I'm talking about, right? The idea of having something centralized in, in what you and I would call a supermarket, that, that is very, very foreign to people um, of this particular time period. Now, you're beginning to see the, the, the emergence of, 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 of leisure, uh, what we might think of as leisure. But again, it's a very different brand of leisure, at least by our modern standards. Leisure was very much governed by inclusivity, community inclusivity, inclusiveness couched within the community. Good example of what I'm talking about would be a medicine show. These two guys come into your town in Nowhereville, Minnesota, and really what they do is they, they put on a show for you, right? They say that they've cured whooping cough and they can demonstrate this and grandpa comes up to the stage and he knocks back a you know a shot of this cough syrup and if it seems to be working for him maybe you buy a bottle but what you definitely would do is you would hang out to the end of that show and even after they left or got chased out of town whatever came first um you'd stay and you you discuss the merits with your townsmen with your neighbors with with with, with your friends and colleagues right it was a form of entertainment We've still got this, that in, the, in this day and age, in the, in the early 21st century, but you call it the, uh, the infomercial, right? Now, I don't think that there's anybody that's watching this out there that would call uh, viewing of an infomercial a really great Saturday night, and I'm not trying to be cute or funny. Um, if you're following along with this on the PowerPoint, you're looking at a baseball team right there. That's not just any baseball team. That would be the first ever professional baseball team, the Cincinnati Red Stockings. What the Cincinnati Red Stockings would do is practice what we call barnstorming, right? And not like the New York Yankees or the Texas Rangers or something like that. It's not like they had a predetermined schedule and played within a league. They were kind of independent contractors in the sense that they would roll through your neck of Iowa, right? They'd come to your little Iowan town and they would say, give me your best nine. I bet you anything that we can beat your best nine. And that was part of the appeal. It was part of the charm. That was what part of what made the red stockings and their barnstorming interesting as they would roll through town to town, challenging each town's best nine. But it was very much governed by the community. This was something that was a part of the community life. And leisure and community are deeply, deeply tied together during this time period. Now, this might sound like a really rough life to you, very monotonous by our standards, but again, uh, there was no such thing as social media during this period. Nobody was coming on to their social media accounts and telling them what a great time that they were missing. And so this was all very normal to the late 19th century American. In this next segment, what I want to talk about would be cultural norms and values in the late 19th century. Because if there was one thing that Americans believed deeply in, it was the concept of individualism. Individualism is a huge, huge concept and would continue to be in our class. This is definitely not the last time that we're going to talk about it. Sometimes you hear this as rugged individualism. It's a very positive thing. It was seen as a very American institution, the idea of individualism. What you really might be able to boil this down to, though, guys, would be the idea that you're responsible for your own lot in life. You are responsible. Nobody else is responsible for it, you, right? If you don't do it, then it's not going to get done. And if it doesn't get done, you're not going to have a lot of material success. Individualism emphasized that you need to take the initiative on your own to put in that time, that effort, and that work to get these jobs done. But if you do that, if you bought in and you worked hard, you had a good attitude, you played by the rules, you were a good moral person, then there was no limit to how high your talents would take you. Individualism was a burden on the one hand, on the sense that uh, nobody's going to do this for you, nobody's going to hold your hand, but on the other hand, the sky was the limit when it comes to how high you could, you could rise. If you were a good individual, you were talented, you could rise very, very high. You could change your stars, so to speak, right? Now, 
part of the reason that people believe deeply in, in the concept of individualism, and this really goes hand in hand with individualism, is another philosophy that we know of as the equality of opportunity. Now, for your notes, what the equality of opportunity drove at is the idea of we're all equal on paper. On paper, we all have an equal chance of making it however you want to define that, right? If that's getting rich, if that is becoming a professional, a lawyer, a doctor, something like that, if that is becoming president of the United States, at least on paper, we have an equal shot, right? It's a free country, and as long as you can get things out of the way, things that prevented individuals from rising, things like unfair business practices, monopolies, for example, things like government requirements, licenses and certificates to become a lawyer or a pharmacist or something, right? As long as you could eliminate those things, there was no limit on the equality of opportunity. So here's the thing. We're really, we're really torn between this image that we want to portray to the rest of the world. A self-controlled, very hard-working, morally responsible, church-going society, and the reality of the situation. And the reality of the situation is, yes, the equality of opportunity is real, but it's real only for a certain segment of the population. You'll see what I mean here in just a second. But if you, if you wanted to put a bow on this, like a, an exclamation point, if you will, think Lincoln's Republic, right? This so-called golden age of American life, where anybody that was willing to work would and did rise in this world. For those of you that have taken the early American history class or um, you know anything about Abraham Lincoln, you'll be able to tell me that he didn't start out um, in a very powerful, let alone prestigious position. His father was a very modest farmer from Kentucky. Um, he chose to go into the law, but it's not as if his dad sent him to Harvard University. He was self-taught. Um, he became a capable lawyer, then he launched a career into politics, and eventually he came to occupy the highest office in the land. He was a guy that worked very hard, put in the time, put in the effort. He was a good individual, and he, he, he attained the ultimate achievement. Not only president of the United States, but very arguably the greatest president in American history. And Lincoln really was defined by this idea that you get out of life what you put into life, right? If you work hard, then good things would come. A lot of people believe that you could measure individualism based on material wealth. If you had somebody that was very wealthy, very well-to-do, then clearly they got to work early, they stayed there late, and they were they, they were thrifty. They, 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 were, they were very conscious of what they were spending money on. If you were poor, you can see where this one's headed, it was probably mostly your fault. But the idea of Lincoln's Republic, it, it also drives directly into probably the most burning issue of the late 19th century, and that'd be slavery. Now, the reason that Lincoln was so opposed to slavery, at least initially, had nothing to do with the immorality of it. It had everything to do with the fact that it, it, it destroyed this idea of you get out of life what you put in. It wasn't the slave owners that were making the, 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 the product, right, that were producing things like cotton and tobacco. It was the slaves. And so from Lincoln's vantage point, this was essentially blasphemy. This, this turned this whole world of individualism and hard work and getting out of life what you put in, it turned it upside down. And so this is really going to be the essence of Lincoln's Republic. Now, the reality of the situation, as I've alluded to, is quite different than what we would like the rest of the world to believe. Is the equality of opportunity real? Yes, it's real. As long as you happen to be two things. As long as you happen to be white and as long as you happen to be a man, right? The reason that we call this time period the segmented society is because opportunity was segmented along the lines of sex and race, okay? Let me explain. Another 19th century cultural norm is a concept, a philosophy really, um, the cult of true womanhood. The idea being that men and women had separate roles to play in life. Man's role was in the public. 
that was going out, earning a living, bringing home the bacon, if you will. It was political. He went out there, he cast in ballots for politics or politicians. Those politicians made decisions when it comes to policy. They enacted those policies. They enforced those policies. Um, the, the law and politics, that was a man's world. It was no place for a lady. A lady's place, a lady's role, was in the home. Women occupied what was known as the domestic sphere. They were to have babies, raise babies, and keep the home. That was their natural so-called role in American life throughout the late 19th century. We're talking about a time period where Harvard, Yale universities, they did not accept female applicants. Um, there were very, very few female doctors. There were things, there were occupations, there were just big realms of American life um, that were patently off limits to the ladies. I mean, I guess it doesn't get any more direct and any more specific than the idea of women lack a public voice in the democratic process, and they're not going to get the vote, uh, this voice, until 1920, 20 years deep into the 20th century, right? So opportunity really is walled off based on your sex. It's also walled off based on race. Now, when I say race, of course I mean people of African-American variety. But really I'm talking about people of color broadly defined. And even, even by those standards, right, people of Latin American ancestry, of Eastern Asian ancestry, people of Irish people of Russian, people of Italian ancestry, um, Eastern and Southern Europe, were not defined as white. I mean, it's really not going to be until after World War II that that variety of the demographics are, are going to be absorbed into the broader, you know, group that might loosely be known as whites in America. It was all people of color, people of immigrant stock and ancestry included. Now, similar to the cult of true womanhood, you can pinpoint a concept that'll drive this point home, and that's actually a Supreme Court case entitled Plessy v. Ferguson. Plessy v. Ferguson would be decided by the court in 1896, and it would involve a man by the name of Homer Plessy, who sat down on a Louisiana railroad car and was removed because he was not white. Louisiana um, segregated the races on the trains, and that was their policy. And this incident went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1896, what the court said in the Plessy decision was as long as those accommodations, those train cars were nod, nod, wink, wink, as long as they were equal, you could segregate however you wanted to. Black and white, old and young, rich and poor, short, tall, did not matter. As long as you had equal accommodations, segregation was perfectly legal, right? For your notes, guys, what Plessy versus Ferguson's going to do is it's going to legalize what we call Jim Crow, right? Separate and unequal. Of, of course, the black schools were always inferior to the white schools. Of course, the waiting facilities in, in, in something like a train station, they were always in theory. The whole point of segregation and, 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 and discrimination was to wall off this opportunity for people that might not fall into the dominant race category, right? And that's really what is going to define race relations in this country for at least the next half century. The idea of separate and unequal. So, what Plessy versus Ferguson is going to do by legalizing Jim Crow is wall off opportunity for people of color the same way that the cult of true womanhood walled off opportunity for, for, for women. So, back to my original question, is the equality of opportunity real? Yes, at least on paper, as long as you happen to be a man and as long as you happen to be white. Now, all of these things aside, we are talking about a time period of unprecedented economic growth. I mean, the time period post-Civil War to the dawn of the 20th century is an absolute boom time in American economic history. How and why? Well, the answer is complicated, but if you take these small town values, Lincoln's Republic, get there early, stay there late, do a good job, buy in, right? You combine it with an ever-increasing population, it's not necessarily that 
American workers are just more productive. There's just so many more of them. And more and more are arriving every day from places like China, places like Italy, places like Russia, places like Mexico. There's all kinds of people emigrating to the United States. The more hands can do more work. You have land expansion. We'll talk about this when we when we get into the development of the Great Plains in the far west. Um, the extraction of resources, the development of big agriculture, more land means more productivity. And of course, you've got the transportation revolution. The transportation revolution is a big one because what this is going to do is it's going to give rise to what we call the railroads. The railroads, what what they're really what they're really going to do is they're going to establish these transportation routes whereby people would be brought into areas and regions where they might extract or refine products, oil, timber, seafood, and then export, bring that raw material back to the east, places like Chicago, places like Philadelphia, New York, where they might be transformed into consumer items. That's really what the transportation revolution is going to do. But if you want an actual example, look no further than the Transcontinental Railroad. This will be completed in the late 19th century. And what it's going to do is it's going to establish a railroad from Chicago, which was the railroad capital of the country at the time, all lines, east, south, north, and of course, west. They all led through Chicago. Um, and it's going to connect with San Francisco. And so now all of a sudden, the idea of being able to get all of those great things out of California and the rest of the West, um, Texas, cattle country, oil, wheat from Kansas, you get the idea. Um, that just became a real viable possibility, and it directly complements our economy. One more example that I'd like you to be familiar with um, that's actually not up there in that PowerPoint, but it's very important. It comes in 1862. And it's brought to us by a guy from Pennsylvania by the name of Justin Morrill, M-O-R-R-I-L-L, -L, Morrill. Morrill has this idea of taking this state-owned land. He happened to be from Pennsylvania, so Pennsylvania had a lot of state-owned land. And donating it, giving it over to institutions of higher learning. And these institutions of higher learning could put that land to good use. What they could do is they could teach engineers both train engineers as well as mechanical engineers, if you understand what I'm saying, agriculturalists, um, scientists, other people that might loosely fall into the category of professionals, um, put the land to work training the next generation of American industrial leaders. What this would develop into is what we call the Moral Land Grant Act of 1862. What you call it would be institutions like Penn State University. My alma mater, Michigan State University, which actually got its start as Michigan Agricultural College. Um, Texas A&M University, also land-grant school. The idea being take that publicly owned land and put it to use by training people of the average American variety. We're not talking about people that would have been destined to go to Harvard. Those were people who, who were coming from families that were well-to-do in the first place. These are institutions where people of the, I'm using a very broad term, working class variety, might send their children and, and, and they could become professionals. This was the hand up. It wasn't a hand out. What Texas A&M will do is it'll give you that helping hand that'll allow you to make something out of yourself, but it's not going to do it for you. And we're circling back to individualism once again. We'll talk more about this dynamic society in future lectures. Um, we're going to see that the evolution of the American economy is going to change life in America, but I'd like to sum up and conclude with you, if I might. The segmented society, it was sort of like this Janus face, if you know anything about Greek mythology, a face in the front and then a face in the back. On the one hand, what we were promoting was hard work and responsibility. On the other hand, what we had was a situation where this equality of opportunity really only applied to a very small segment of the population. There's some good old-fashioned hypocrisy going on, if you understand what I'm saying. And muddying this situation even more, 
You might even go so far as to say institutionalizing what we might call inequality um, is the industrialization of the American economy. What industrialization is going to bring, at least in my mind, is a lot of unanticipated consequences. Now you're going to see what I'm talking about as this class continues to unfold, really beginning with our next lecture. But for right now, guys, that's all I have.